Well, once again, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are, don't know me, my name is Heath Thomas. I'm the president of OBU. And it is my distinct privilege to welcome you to the 2021 J.M. Gaskin Lecture. The friends of Dr. J.M. Gaskin and advocates for the preservation of Baptist history and heritage in the state of Oklahoma established the J.M. Gaskin Lectureship. Gaskin and his 15 books about Oklahoma Baptists provided the major drive for Oklahoma Baptist research and publications over the last four decades. Who was Gaskin? Dr. Gaskin served as the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma's first historical director. He was founder and the first, of the, uh, and the first historical secretary of the Oklahoma Baptist Historical Commission in 1952. He was the founding president of the Oklahoma Baptist Historical Society, founded in 1956, and was the editor of the Oklahoma Baptist Chronicle from 1958 to 1998. In honor of Dr. Gaskin's passion and accomplishments, he intend, the intended purpose of the lectureship is to provide and sustain a series of lectures that will preserve and promote the study of Oklahoma Baptist history and heritage. And beginning a number of years ago, around 2017, uh, carrying with Dr. Gaskin's uh, passion to preserve particular Baptist identity amongst affinity groups and uh, different constituents in the state of Oklahoma, we founded a multi-year study on black Baptists in Oklahoma. In fact, Dr. Gaskin published a book called Black Baptists in Oklahoma from its origins to 1990, which was a major contribution to the field. Taking up that legacy, OBU through the Gaskin Lectureship explored Bap uh, black Baptist experience in Oklahoma, whether we're talking about the history from 1990 to today, the preaching and the art uh, of black preaching, to even today, the church's response to the 1921 um, Tulsa Race Massacre. So what we're talking about is carrying on the tradition uh, that has loomed large in Gaskin's legacy, and uh, we're carrying that forward for today. I'm delighted to introduce to you our speaker who is a friend, Reverend Anthony Scott. Scott has served in pastoral ministry for 28 years the last 13 of those years in his current position as the lead pastor of First North Tulsa. He has previously spoken on the OBU campus, including during the o, uh, 2019 OBU Pastor School, as well as during chapel services, uh, most recently in 2018. Scott is a graduate of Thomas A. Edison High School in Tulsa before earning a Bachelor in Business Administration from Langston University. He owned both a, both a Master of Theology and a Master of Ministry from Andersonville Theological Seminary. He's the Vice President of the Western Region of the National Baptist Convention USA and is the President of the Oklahoma Baptist State Convention. He served briefly as Adjunct Professor at Bacon College and has served as guest lecturer at OBU, Tulsa Community College, as well as other academic institutions. Fulfilling his passion to write, he contributes regularly to the Oklahoma Eagle and periodically to the Tulsa World and the Baptist Messenger. Today's topic, especially for me as the president of OBU, is not only timely, I think it's needed. It's a story that we need to hear. One of the things that Gaskin did is he looked at, uh, as I say, a lot of different groups uh, in the history of Oklahoma Baptist, Oklahoma Baptist women, et cetera, and he framed up for us the conversation of black Baptists in Oklahoma. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're not aware of the 1921 race massacre, you need to. In honor of the significance of today's lecture, we have a number of distinguished guests here. We have representatives from Oklahoma Baptist, Dr. Walter Wilson, Dr. James Swain are here. Gentlemen, if you would, please stand so we can recognize you. Applause 
We have uh, the inestimable Dr. John Reed here as well. Dr. Reed, could you stand to be recognized? And then a variety of other pastors from our churches. And pastors, if you don't mind, would you please stand? <laughs> Following today's lunch, uh, lecture, we do have a luncheon for pastors. So if you have uh, pastor friends who uh, would like to come, uh, let me know. We have a place for you. We're going to be talking a little bit more in depth about the lecture, but also charting ways forward. Uh, at that luncheon, which is hosted by our Black Student Association and our president here of the Black Student Association, Brock, why don't you stay and be recognized? Uh, we're going to have a, uh, they're going to host it for us and we're going to have a continued conversation. So if you'd like to be a part of that, let me know. Okay. With no further ado, Pastor Scott, thank you so much for being here. Let's please welcome Pastor Anthony Scott. Good morning uh, to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Thomas. I want to certainly thank him uh, for the introduction, for his hospitality, uh, for his friendship, and also for uh, certainly his prayers. Uh, to Dr. Peterson, uh, we thank you so much, sir, for uh, the opportunity to share uh, in this chapel uh, lecture series. Uh, I have attended uh, many of the previous uh, lectures uh, and certainly honored uh, to be able to share uh, in the lecture series uh, on this year. Uh, to the pastors uh, who are present, uh, particularly to those who belong to the Oklahoma Baptist State Convention, uh, I want to thank you for being here. You uh, made mention of uh, Dr. John Reed. Uh, he is also my pastor, and so I'm certainly honored uh, to have him here uh, on today. Uh, God is certainly good, and we certainly want to honor the students uh, the faculty and staff uh, of this distinguished institution uh, who are here on uh, this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm here to lecture uh, and not to preach. Uh, one of the things that helps me not to preach and lecture is you didn't have any music prior um, uh, to my preaching. Uh, and then also when I came for the sound check, they asked me if I wanted to be able to move around and I said, no, if I stand still, uh, that'll keep me in the lecture, uh, in the lecture mode. Uh, I've been tasked with the responsibility uh, of talking about the church's response uh, to the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Uh, as was mentioned uh, by President Thomas, uh, I pastor First Baptist Church North Tulsa, which is the mother church of North Tulsa. Uh, the church founded in 1899. Uh, and so in 1921, our church actually was situated right on the border uh, between the north and the south side. I say that to say that our church was untouched during the 1921 race massacre. Uh, there is a marker in front of our church that says that our church was untouched because it was sitting right on the dividing line between the two different parts of town. And because our church, they thought, looked too nice to be a black church, it was bypassed. Other churches in the area, Vernon AME, Mount Zion, were completely destroyed. But as I talk about the church's response to the Tulsa Race Massacre, um, I really want to talk about hallowed halls and look at this tragedy through what we might call the lens, the lens of faith. And so as we look at the Tulsa Race Massacre through the lens of faith, uh, again, I'm not here to preach, but I wouldn't be a preacher if I didn't take a text. So I want to call us to Lamentations, third chapter. I just want to read a few verses beginning with verse 19. The prophet writes, remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, 
my soul has them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. And verse 24 says, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. The voice of the church must encompass suffering, pain, sorrow, evil, and tragedy. The voice of the church, the preaching of the church, the proclamation of the church must encompass, must speak to suffering, pain, sorrow, evil, and tragedy as a part of our human journey in life. The voice of the church, when it comes to evil and suffering and even tragedy, must grapple with three questions. Number one, where is God in all of this? As we reflect uh, on the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, we've got to ask ourselves, where is God in all of this? But then secondly, we've got to ask ourselves, what does this say about God? But then the next homiletical question is actually this, and that is, where is the hope in all of this? As we talk about the church's response and as we talk about reflecting, we know that reflection and remembering are part of the biblical narrative, particularly when it comes to the Old Testament. God uh, is always calling upon his people to think back, to remember, to reflect. Not only to think back, remember, and reflect on those good days in the past, but reflect and remember and ponder those days in our past that we really would like to forget, right? And when God wants us to reflect, it's not simply to have a nostalgic look back. God wants us to reflect because he wants us to have some great prospects for the future. And so as we reflect uh, on the Tulsa Race Massacre of 100 uh, years ago, uh, we look back not only from the standpoint of being nostalgic, not only from the standpoint of commemorating, but we want to move from what was a very tragic occurrence to a more positive and a more bright future. And my friends, the only voice that can give hope, the only voice that can bring life out of death, the only voice that can bring hope out of a tragedy even 100 years ago is the church and the body of Christ. Listen, a theology that can't help us transition between life and death and vice versa is a useless theology. Edited tragedy leaves no room for God. Edited tragedy leaves no room for God. In Romans chapter five and verse eight, it says that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for our unedited ugliness. Christ died for our unedited ugliness. None of us can respond to the gospel message 
if we edit our past. Repentance, salvation, are about being honest about our ugly past. And so the voice of the church in reflection has to make a world, a city, a nation wrestle with its ugly past. Not to demonize anyone, but in order that we might provide an avenue or an entrance for the gospel message that helps us all deal with our ugly past. And so the church, uh, as we talk about the gospel, we know that the gospel has an answer for what took place 100 years ago in historic Greenwood or Black Wall Street. The gospel says that the light not only shines in the darkness, but walks in the darkness. A unique contribution to church history uh, is that of the black church. The black church has a unique contribution uh, to the history of Christianity. The history of the black church is a church that sustains, encourages, and provides hope in the wake of tragedy and despair. As we take a look and reflect, and time does not permit for me to deal with all of the history uh, of historic black Wall Street, uh, where my church actually resides even on today. But for those who are interested, we know there's a, a, a plethora of information. You certainly must chronicle the history of Greenwood Black Wall Street. It was given its name by Booker T. Washington, who when he visited, uh, named it Negro Wall Street because of its bustling commerce. In fact, there are those, and I know many may be familiar with Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance, and Harlem being uh, the place where all of the poetry that was coming from the African American culture was coming, but there are estimates that say that in 1921, the income generated on Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, exceeded that of Harlem in New York. You've got to chronicle the history, but also understand that it did not happen in isolation. There was an atmosphere of race relations in the United States of America, both locally and nationally, that led up to the incident on May 31st, 1921. It did not simply happen out of nowhere. Had it not happened in Tulsa, it would have happened someplace else. So we've got to think about how racial tension and racial animosity can lead to these events taking place. On that particular day, the events that may be considered a normal day or a normal day that turned into a very destructive day. As we look at the events that took place, we see also the role of churches before, during, and after the tragic events on May 31st and June 1st of 1921. But then we've also got to take a look at the current role of churches in our cities and in our struggling situations. The context, my friends, of this, this lament by the prophet Jeremiah. As you know, a lament, uh, this is a liturgical song in which the nation bewails its fate following a calamity or a tragedy. We look at the Lamentations of Jeremiah and we see the sorrows of Zion. In chapter one, verses one through three, we uh, even move forward and see the hope of relief stemming from God's mercy. Book of Lamentations, as we reflect, as we talk about the voice of the church, uh, it helps us to know that wherever there is total destruction, there can be total redemption. The Book of Lamentations, five poems, 
Five laments, they are an expression of grief. The city of Tulsa led the entire nation, even the entire world, uh, in grieving and emoting over very tragic event. The poet here is grieving over the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 586 BC. This lament is a first-hand count of despair, of pain. A prophet is a survivor. First-hand accounts are more powerful than just general historical accounts. First-hand accounts are powerful because we can read, for instance, uh, during World War II, the history and learn about Hitler's awful invasion and terrible acts of genocide. These general historical accounts will affect you and I on a very basic level. But when you read a personal account of the profound effects of Hitler's atrocities, for instance, in the diary of Anne Frank, we learn about the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands from the perspective of a young girl who experienced it. First-hand accounts affect us on a much deeper level than general historical accounts. For instance, when you look at the context of Lamentations, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, the historical books of the Bible uh, give us a general context for what takes place. But when we read Lamentations, it gives us a very personal account. There are many historical accounts of what took place uh, in 1921, but there are survivors of that massacre who give a first-hand account, a very personal account of what took place, and we thank God for their accounts because then it resonates with us on a much deeper level. When we look at Lamentations, it's basically five poems. And in these five poems, I want us to note that poem one, two, four, and five, you may refer to them as chapters, all contain exactly 22 verses. Why? They all begin with uh, a letter uh, uh, of the Hebrew alphabet. This poem begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, then uh, the next verse begins with the second, and so on and so on. That's the basic structure. But I want to say something about that basic structure. The alphabetic structure seems to communicate that even in the chaos of devastation and tragedy, there is still a sense of order in the world. And the voice of the church, whether it be the tragedy of 1921 or whether it be a tragedy that occurs on tomorrow, must let the world know that we serve a God that can bring order out of any chaotic and tragic situation. Now, what is very interesting, I mentioned that poem one, two, four, and five all have 22 verses, but right almost in the middle, poem three has 66 verses, uh, uh, three times as many as the others. Why is that? When we look at chapter three, uh, it's as if, and you'll often find in the Bible uh, that when it comes to grace and when it comes to hope, uh, that God doesn't wait until the end of the story to give us a glimpse of his grace and hope. Whenever we are experiencing tragedy and hopelessness and unedited ugliness, God always gives us a preview of his grace before we get to the end. In fact, when we go back to the book of the beginnings, Genesis, we find that when we fall and we are the most ugly that we have ever been, when the penalty and the stain uh, of sin uh, entered into humankind, God right there in the beginning gives us a glimpse of his grace and an offer of hope. We see this 
in this book, because in chapter three, right in the middle of the poem, which is the middle of the whole book, the poet places the central message of the book and really of the whole Bible when he talks about the steadfast love of God. God's unwavering covenant faithfulness towards uh, the people that he wants to redeem in spite of chaos, confusion, and all around, this, my friends, is the hope of the believer and the unending grace of God. One of the things that I fear is that as the whole world was focused on the tragic events of 1921 in Tulsa, the church and the body of Christ missed a golden and grand opportunity to let the world know how the gospel of Jesus Christ can take an unedited tragedy and restore it for his good. When we think about Lamentations, it begins in chapter one talking about how the city sits solitary. As we look at the history, you know that Greenwood, Negro Wall Street was a bustling economic city almost in and of itself that was full of people, just like the city of Jerusalem, it was thriving. It was a bustling city. Her streets were full of people. You could hear the voices of merchants crying out for those to come and to purchase their wares. Pilgrims from all over would come by the thousands, but now the city sits lonely because many of its people were killed in the siege. They were sitting quietly, they were lonely and deserted. We see that in the A part of verse one of chapter one. But in the B part, we see the same thought used in different words. That's parallelism. It says, the city has become a widow. That was a culture that that placed a great deal uh, of value on widows because they were vulnerable. Widows had no property rights. Uh, they, 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 they were marginalized in their living, so much so that Jewish law had a provision to protect widows. Listen, often they were reduced to desperate circumstances financially and they were subject to exploitation. After the devastation of historic Greenwood, we find just like the city of Jerusalem, Historic Black Wall Street in a matter of 24 hours went from being a princess to a widow. She wept bitterly in the night, as it says in verse two, because things had gone from bad to worst, uh, had gone from being independent to dependent. But the good news as we see the transition in chapter three, verse 19, my affliction and my misery, he talks about uh, the wormwood and the gall, which uh, brings to mind in the Hebrew word picture, this idea uh, of bitterness, this idea uh, of sorrow. But when we combine this, this, this metaphor with the bitterness of life, and we think about the bitterness of that tragic event, we notice in verse 20, the writer talks about the thought and how that burden weighs him down. But right there in the middle, he says in verse 21 through 24 of chapter three, therefore I have hope. You notice the pivot. He switches from despair to hope. And I want you to know something. If we simply reflect, reflect, on the tragic events of 1921, without utilizing the glory of the gospel to help us pivot from despair to hope. Look, if you simply review your past without any hopeful options for the future, you'll really wind up being depressed that there have to be some hopeful outcomes. There have to be some hopeful uh, takeaways. And so we see the prophet as 
he is reflecting. Somewhere there is a pivot and he talks about hope. Never denying the terrible consequences, but there is also no denying that there is a God who had redeemed them from a terrible situation in the past and that same God can give hope to the terrible situations we face in the present. And he says it all pivots on the steadfast love of God. And that steadfast love of God is that covenant faithfulness of God. It is that love of God that pursues us when we are running from him. That steadfast love of God is that love that tracks us down when we are attempting to be as bad and as ugly and as evil as we want to be. That steadfast love of God continues to pursue us. And so rather than running from our unedited ugliness in 1921, we need to interject some hope. And that is the steadfast love of God that actually is running around looking for those who are ugly. Do you not remember in Luke chapter 19, uh, folks, uh, actually all throughout Luke, folk were always coming after our Christ and our Jesus because he was a friend of ugly folk. Sinners, publicans, why does he sit and eat with them? Why does he socialize with ugliness? Why is he drawn to the worst of humanity? He told Zacchaeus, he said he came to seek and to save them that are lost, them that are the most ugly. My friends, there is a word, and that word, the steadfast love of God, is a word that involves action rather than just loving feelings. And so when we talk about the steadfast love of God and the response of the church to 1921, that, that love of God that should be expressed in us is more than simply about emoting. It is about love in action. Particularly we see in verses 25 through 30 that he is a God who is waiting for us. The love of God is a love that always rights the wrong. There was a minister that preached a sermon on forgiveness and he urged God's people to get right with God. He noticed that people were at odds with one another. Uh, they were uh, enemies of one another. And so he emphasized that God's people can't be right with God if they are wrong with one another. And so he said, if it is within their power to right the wrong, they should, based on Romans 12 and 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. On that, he made the point that in order to be right with God, uh, there has to be a love that rights the wrong. And that pierced like an arrow to the heart. And I know as we reflect on 1921, we can emote, but then we can ask ourselves, what does it mean for love to right the wrong? When we think about Jesus, the steadfast love of God in sending Christ to die on the cross. It was not simply about God and eternity past uh, emoting love. He actually acted to send his son in order that that love might right the wrong. And as believers in God, uh, it is our responsibility to right the wrongs of the past. Not simply by emoting, but a love, my friends, that rights the wrong. Now, none of us can do this in and of ourselves. None of us is sufficient in and of these things. 
So there is an importance in resting in the sovereignty of God. We have an invitation to realize that God is sovereign. The race massacre did not catch God by surprise. We can rest in knowing that his love, his care, and his ultimate concern for us will right all wrongs. The future can only be right and restoration can only come if we interject the gospel that will help to change all of our unedited past, even the unedited past of 1921. My friends, as I close, we still deal with the racial animosity and tension even still today. But the good news is, is that God has called the church to be a voice of reconciliation. As we are ambassadors for Christ, we are yet still that voice that is sustaining, encouraging, offering hope in order that we might be reconciled to God but then also be reconciled to one another. And that vertical and horizontal reconciliation will make sure that events like 1921 never happen again. God, we thank you for your word that strengthens, and sustains. We thank you, God, for the gift of the church You've placed us in the dark world that we might not only be a light that shines in the darkness, but that we might walk in the darkness. And God, as we show the light of your love and the light of your grace in a very dark world, we know that we are showing people to the Christ that can bring hope out of a hopeless situation. Father, we thank you. Pray, God, that the little message, the little notes that have been shared will resonate with those who are listening in person and even those who are viewing virtually, that we might be the hands, the heart, and the love of God that rights all wrong. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.